morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. I'm delighted to be speaking here today on an issue very close to my heart and my own pedagogical values and beliefs, Paolo Freire. Firstly, I would like to say that I'm a little apprehensive about discussing Freire in a conference where most of the participants are from Latin America, which is obviously where Freire was so active and influential in his heyday. In this talk, I'll begin by exploring, exploring and explaining what led me to choose this particular topic before moving on to outlining Freire's key pedagogical views. After this, I will share what, in my view, are some of the general features of contemporary ELT and analyze them under a Frarean lens, evaluating what Freire might have made of these points. I will then give a 10 point program of what a more Frarean ELT sector could look like before offering some short concluding thoughts. And after this, there will also be a few minutes for questions and I'll provide a link where you can download these slides. So from the very beginning of this talk, I think it's worth critically reflecting on how Freire is seen today, both globally, but also specifically within Latin America. So in Brazil, uh, the land of his birth and much of his work, opinion is sharply divided, as it is with so many issues. When on the campaign trail, uh, campaigning to be president, uh, Jair Bolsonaro said that he would enter the education ministry with a flamethrower to remove Paulo Freire. Furthermore, a former education minister in his ministry described Freire and pedagogy as voodoo without scientific proof. But on the other hand, as is evident in this picture of student protests against education cuts in Brazil in 2019, there are many who want to keep Freire's flame burning bright. When translated, this placard reads, less Olavo de Cavallo, more Paulo Freire. Olavo de Cavallo is a Brazilian far-right pundit who described Freire as a pseudo-intellectual militant who produced a collection of tricks to reduce education to sectarian indoctrination. When I was invited to speak at this conference, the British Council very kindly gave me a lot of flexibility in choosing what I would speak about. But I chose Freire, and there are three main reasons for this. The first reason is because I think Freire is underknown in many parts of the world. Indeed, in 2019, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the publication of Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Budabab Bhattacharya argues that much of Freire's educational teaching methods remain revolutionary because much of modern education still falls embarrassingly short of Freire's vision. It is my view that a better understanding of this work and pedagogical values would lead to better educational systems. The second reason is that contemporary ELT faces a wide range of challenges and problems, and I believe that analyzing these challenges from a Freirean viewpoint can offer viable solutions. And thirdly, seemingly as with everything else these days, because of COVID, such has been the seismic impact of the pandemic, there is the potential for radical change in education. And again, Freire's ideas have considerable value in attempts to shape the post-COVID educational landscape. As long as I have been professionally involved in education, some 25 years or so, Freire has always been an important talisman to me. Given this, when my most recent publication with Cambridge University Press, Teaching in Challenging Circumstances, was printed last year, I was delighted to be able to include the following quotation on the title page. To me, this quotation sums up my rationale for working in education. To wash one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful, not to be neutral. It is this position which I have always tried to place at the heart of my work in education, even when I have worked in a very wide range of contexts. And it's this position which is at the heart of my talk here today. Paolo Freire lived a long and active life. He wrote or contributed to more than 20 books about education and pedagogy. In trying to understand and unpick his pedagogical and educational views, 
what we might call a frarian pedagogy, we run into some of the same issues as when people use the term Orwellian. That is, it can be used in many and diverse ways, sometimes accurately, but often not. This said, there are still clear and unambiguous aspects of a Frarian pedagogy, which we will briefly look at now. My apologies if these are already well known to you, but as discussed earlier, in many parts of the world, Frary's work remains underknown, and so I feel it's necessary and important component of this talk. I'll do this by presenting four quotations and work back from those to unpick the wider pedagogical point he is making. Given the holistic, all-encompassing nature of Frary's pedagogical viewpoint, there are clear overlaps between some of these points. We'll begin with the following quotation uh, I mentioned a few moments ago. To me, this quotation highlights the central importance of power and power relations within Freire's conceptualization of education. Freire's starting point in the classroom is to challenge, and through this challenge, to undermine the power dynamics that hold some people above others. Freire's conceptualization can be described as a liberation pedagogy, emerging around the same time as the phenomenon of liberation theology, which flourished in particular in Latin America in the 1960s, and its social concern for the poor and political liberation for oppressed peoples. The second quotation, leaders who do not act dialogically, but insist on imposing their decisions, do not organize the people, they manipulate them. They do not liberate, nor are they liberated, they oppress. For Freire, the pre-existing rigid division between teacher and student reinforced the power dynamics outlined in the first quotation. This traditional pedagogy was dehumanizing, and it was dehumanizing not just for the student, but for the teacher as well. It was crucial that teachers and students had a more equal horizontal relationship, that they saw themselves as co-creators of learning, they recognize in each other that they have different and specific experiences and expertise to offer, and that they can both benefit from the process of knowledge exchange. The third quotation, liberating education consists in acts of cognition, not transferals of information. One of the concepts most commonly associated with Freire is that of the so-called banking model of education, which he was very critical of. The pedagogic aim of the banking model was to fill up the learner as a receiving object rather than an active agent with appropriate forms of knowledge using a transmission model of education in which lecturing, memorization and repetition were dominant. The Portuguese term which Freire used to describe this development of critical consciousness is consciciaso, and he links this to his belief in praxis, that is, the importance of reflection and action upon the world in order to, translate, to transform it. My apologies for the pronunciation there to the Portuguese speakers in the audience. And the final quotation in this section, language is never neutral. For Freire, language is at the center of the learning process. Language choice and language usage is crucial. Its importance is directly related to the ideology which lies behind language and the inherent power relations. So we move on to our third section then, which is contemporary ELT under a Frarian lens. And in this stage, <clears throat> we will zoom back slightly from the world of Paolo Freire, or perhaps more accurately take a step forward to the world of contemporary ELT. Clearly, there are a number of challenges in trying to identify general features of contemporary ELT, considering the multiplicity of contexts in which English language learning takes place. As such, what I've tried to do here is to give a descriptive view of several of the dominant trends as I see it, some of which relate to teaching in national contexts, whilst others relate to the teaching of English in international contexts. It does not purport to be comprehensive but rather to trace some of the dominant themes, which I then analyze under a Frarian lens. 
And the picture which I've chosen to illustrate this slide is the first Google image result I got when searching English language teaching. It's a picture of an excellent book, Jeremy Harmer's classic, The Practice of English Language Teaching. Although it is slightly depressing that this is the fifth edition, and I clearly remember using the first edition published in 1998. But the question I have is, to what extent is this representative of contemporary ELT? Certainly at first glance, the book suggests the internationalist multi-ethnic context of much English language teaching. But the more we critically analyze the images, the less accurate the representation seems. Teachers are smiling broadly, looking relaxed, and everything is under control. They have time to give meaningful small group support. Everyone is dressed well and looks in the prime of life. And even when there is a blackboard, the slate is beautifully manicured. As I say, this is no slight on the contents of the book, but this is not the reality of much English language teaching worldwide. Rather, it is a simulacrum of reality. That is, something that replaces reality with its representation. It is what John Paul Sartre called the derealization of the whole surrounding world of everyday reality. And what Jean Baudrillard described as a form of hyper-reality, where the dominant images and representations do not depict a situation with any real existence but yet these images come to constitute reality. I would not necessarily go this far, since English language of this type, English teaching of this type certainly does exist, but for the overwhelming majority of English language learners worldwide, the reality is very different. In my experience, the reality is closer to something like these images. And I believe that the following text written more than 50 years ago by Neil Postman and Charles Weingartner in Teaching as a Subversive Activity, which I also quote in the introduction to my new book alongside Frary, sadly still holds true today in many, many English language teaching contexts. They say, passive acceptance is a more desirable response to ideas than active criticism. Discovering knowledge is beyond the power of students and is, in any case, none of their business. Recall is the highest form of intellectual achievement and the collection of unrelated facts is the goal of education. The voice of authority is to be trusted and valued more than independent judgment. One's own ideas and those of one's classmates are inconsequential. Feelings are irrelevant in education. There is always a single unambiguous right answer to a question. So then taking a global macro level view, I offer a general overview of contemporary ELT according to five of the 10 key themes of this conference, along with a Frarian analysis of each of them. And as I say, due to a lack of time, I will focus only on these following five themes, whilst also touching on some of the others as I do so. So namely managing language and teaching, assessment, equality, diversity, and inclusion, research evidence and good practice, and curriculum materials and lesson planning. So the first theme then we will look at managing learning and teaching. So despite the common cliche about student talking time and teacher talking time, and the often told story that a learner-centered approach is common across the ELT sector, the case remains that in many parts of the world, a teacher-centered, transmissive, jug and mug model of pedagogy, however you want to describe it, is still the most common way in which students are taught. Four of the main reasons for this are as follows. So firstly, untrained, inexperienced teachers teach as they were taught when they were at school. This is the dominant approach, which is still found in many teacher training colleges around the world. This is the approach which is expected by many parents, head teachers, inspectors, and institutions. And when facing large classes and few resources, teachers find it more comfortable to adopt a teacher centric model. So for me, I think that learner centeredness is often overrepresented in the ELT sector as a whole, 
because a teacher-centered uh, pedagogy is often used in schools and community communities which are marginalized economically, socially, and politically, and consequently lack power and agency, meaning that their voice is therefore diminished or even absent. Throughout his writing, Freire was consistent about the importance of the teacher, notwithstanding the criticisms of Youngman in 1986, who argued that Freire thought that under his model, educators were not needed. For Freire, it was not so much that they weren't needed. Indeed, he said that they were absolutely necessary, but rather that what is bad, what is not necessary, is authoritarianism rather than authority. Freire imagined a repurposed relationship between educational stakeholders, which would be achieved through a critical and dialogic approach. As he said, the teacher of the students and the students of the teacher cease to exist and a new term emerges, teacher-student with students-teachers. When looked at from a critical pedagogy position, a teacher-centric model also replicates the neoliberal paradigm within the classroom with clear hierarchies in place. It also sits alongside the process of language commodification, which primarily sees language in economic terms. For Freire, the goal of education and specifically literacy and language development was preparation for a self-managed life rather than the world of subordinated labor or careers. Freire wanted students to have the opportunity to become themselves. And in an ELT sector, where neoliberalism not only shapes the theory, but also the practice in the form of, for example, international publishers and an often racially coded native speakerism, this is very difficult to do. Theme seven, assessment. So the dominance of the high stakes standardized summative assessment, often in the form of exams, is commonplace in the ELT sector. Grades, marks and scores are generally seen as representing the essence of success. Allied to this, it is common for knowledge about language to be valued more than the ability to use the language. As one teacher in Jordan put it to me when I did research there, teachers correct grammar and pronunciation in class to show that they know particular things about the language as they are not confident in their own pedagogy. Clearly, it is also much easier to mark and to process exams which are focused on, for example, isolated grammatical and lexical forms. Assessing speaking, uh, even though this is probably the most crucial and most useful of all the skills for the typical learner of English, is seldom done because it is complex and subjective. However, there are lots of students around the world who are skilled at passing tests and peacock-like are able to display their knowledge of English, but who are often unable to use it meaningfully for anything. The dominant form of assessment emerges directly out of what Freire described as the banking concept of education. When considering the role of assessment and in particular exams in furthering this agenda, Freire emphasizes its dehumanizing nature. Freire was highly critical of pedagogic approaches which focused on teaching to the test. Rather, learning should be seen as a continual process which is allied to positive social change. The dehumanizing nature of the process is described very interestingly in a 2020 article shown here by Eric Ruiz Bybee entitled Too Important to Fail, the banking concept of education and standardized testing in an urban middle school. Three extracts uh, from this article highlight some of these endemic problems. He writes, uh, these are from uh, notes in his journal that he makes. <clears throat> Today, we had to give the English language art state exam. This meant that I had to spend four periods reading a test out loud first to a group of eighth grade special education and English language learner students, and two more periods of reading out loud to a seventh grade class. My voice still aches from all the reading that I had to do. Next one. 
Some students reach their frustration level pretty quickly with the short answer essay section. Since the proctoring rules prohibited me from either explaining things in Spanish or pointing to parts of the test, I ended up having to pantomime things for Jose, who neither speaks nor writes English well enough to do anything other than pick out cognate words. And the third quotation, under contract with Pearson Education, my school and others across the state were required to administer field tests to our students to help the company fine tune questions for the following year's exams. One other detail about this, which is both amusing and deeply depressing in equal measure, is that should you wish to access this excellent article about the concept of education and how it unfairly disadvantages already marginalized learners, it will cost you 35 pounds or 50 US dollars unless you have access through an institution. Theme eight, equality, diversity, and inclusion. So turning now to EDI, I would like to focus on an integral embedded component of this, namely the medium or media of instruction used in the classroom. The recent global trend for this has been away from local or national vernaculars and towards English as a medium of instruction. A decade ago, Stephen Walter and Carol Benson estimated that around 40% of the global population, the majority living in the global south, lack access to education in a language which they can either speak or understand. That proportion is now likely to be much higher not least as a result of the rapid growth worldwide of low-cost private schools. And even the world's newest nation state, South Sudan, adopted EMI, English as a medium of instruction, despite the general population having very low levels of English. <clears throat> as noted earlier, Freire had extremely strong views towards language, seeing it as a core component of identity. Uh, and what the language of instruction should be. In Freire and Macedo 1987, Literacy, Reading the Word and the World, the importance of this is highlighted. Three quotations from this work, which I think encapsulate Freire's views, are as follows. Literacy can only be emancipatory and critical to the extent that it is conducted in the language of the people. The second one. It is through the native language that students name their world. And thirdly, literacy conducted in the dominant standard language empowers the ruling class by sustaining the status quo. It supports the maintenance of the elitist model of education. This sidelining of indigenous languages in education, particularly in English language teaching, has led to what Freire described as a culture of silence. Freire would also be against the ascendancy and power of dominant forms of English, primarily British and American English, as well as native speakerism. In his own time, Freire was wholehearted in his support for non-standard Portuguese dialects, ways of speaking and syntax, which were shaped in part by the post-colonial writer Franz Fanon, and his analysis of the distinctions between his Creole French and so-called proper French. This said, Freire also noted the political expediency for a learner to acquire the ability to use the language or dialect of the oppressor. Theme nine, research evidence and good practice. The relationship between research and practice in ELT has often been a bumpy one with both groups unsure, if not actually suspicious of the other. In the contemporary world of ELT, the two groups seem further away from each other than ever before. In a well-known and influential article uh, in 2016 entitled, More Research is Needed, A Mantra Too Far, Alan Maley makes the point that generally, the balance between research and teaching is heavily weighted in favor of research which is unhealthy for both groups, and that researchers are accorded higher status than teachers. He also argues that the majority of advances and new ideas within language pedagogy do not, in any case, have their origins in research. Some of the other reasons for the disconnect 
between research and, cl and classroom practice are identified uh, as follows. Firstly, that teachers lack access and finances to access paywalled academic research, as we've just uh, discussed. Secondly, teachers lack time to implement evidence-led research. Thirdly, teachers are often not supported by other educational stakeholders in implementing changes, for example, because of assessment pressures. And fourthly, all of the above are complicated uh, by the COVID and post-COVID landscape and the emerging pressures therein. For Freire, as discussed earlier, praxis is crucial. Research should have to be for something and make a tangible difference. Freire would be more supportive of forms of research, such as teacher-led research, action research, and reflective practice, in which teachers are vital and central actors in the process. Indeed, he would want to go even further than this and advocate for exploratory action research in which other educational stakeholders are explicitly involved in the process, learners in particular who can be potent forces in his process. As he argues in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, dialogical theory requires that the world be unveiled. No one can, however, unveil the world for another. In short, outsider researchers cannot do the work of understanding for others. An example of the kind of research which Freire would be supportive of is outlined in a presentation by Richard Smith entitled Research is for Teachers, You Must Be Joking, in which he discovers, uh, sorry, in which he discusses the Champion Teachers Project in Chile. And if we look here, uh, is a link to uh, the British Council publication about this project, which may be of interest. And some of the quotations regarding this project link directly to Freire's views on this issue. So, for example, on criticality. Uh, my research journey started with a feeling, just a feeling that something wasn't right. Going from that feeling to asking why and finding out what works is the key on praxis and practical relevance. Action research is important because it lights a spark in the darkness of the system. It lights a spark in the mentality of the people who do not want to change. And on a more equitable relationship between students and teachers, I heard my students, I saw myself. And on to the final theme, which we're going to look at in this section, curriculum materials and lesson planning. So in the, common, uh, in the current world of ELT, it is common for the syllabus to be synthetic. Uh, that is, different parts of language are taught separately, step by step, in an additive fashion. The implication of this is that the focus uh, is on isolated grammar and lexis, with a syllabus which is directly linked to assessment processes with the one reinforcing the other. For Freire, he'd wish to challenge the very notion of a curriculum. Uh, by definition, for Freire, a curriculum is intentional. Choices are made, and there is an inherent bias towards those who are creating it. A curriculum, like education, cannot be neutral. In his own time, Freire saw the curriculum as a relic of Brazil's colonial past. Freire, I believe, would wish to decolonize the curriculum and advocate for other forms of knowledge, echoing some of the ideas expressed, for example, in works such as Epistemologies of the South, which we can see pictured here. Uh, in this work, de Souza Santos explains explicitly uh, the links between the role of language within education systems and social and epistemic justice. He demands that learners have the right to speak their own language. To deny them this is an act of violence and helps to justify policies of inclusion and exclusion. The absence of the language to express particular ideas, knowledges and epistemologies can lead to abyssal thinking, in which Western modes of thinking are granted the monopoly of the universal distinction between true and false to the detriment of alternative bodies of knowledge. 
a curriculum which does not take into account these other forms of knowledge and the language in which these forms are expressed can be said to be committing epistemicide. So on to our fourth section now then, uh, a Frarian EOT agenda. So following on from our analysis of certain features and commonalities of contemporary EOT, I now put forward uh, a 10 point plan of Frarian agenda for EOT. But just prior to doing this, I thought it might be interesting and instructive to look at two examples within the Americas of where a Frarian approach has been used more widely in education systems in recent times. The first example comes from Tucson, Arizona in the United States in the form of the Paolo Freire Freedom Schools. Three, uh, three extracts from their curriculum and instruction page uh, are as follows. Uh, all humans deserve a life of dignity and all of us as stewards of the planet. We design our curricula backwards. We begin by designating what learning is essential and then plan how to get students to demonstrate those desired learning outcomes using essential questions that are provocative, relevant, and multifaceted. And we use project-based learning, PBL. Additionally, we incorporate science, technology, engineering, and maths, STEM, into our integrated units of instruction. And three further extracts from their page on experiential learning are also given here. So twice a year, we break from regular classroom instruction to instead pursue topics of, of interest in depth for a week, e.g. political music theatre, law, urban gardening. On a regular basis, students explore their community in field trips that build background knowledge, connect school learning to real world experiences and help prepare students for life in the adult world. And thirdly, service learning is woven into all aspects of our school. And for an example uh, from Mexico, uh, specifically Guerrero and the University of the Peoples of the South, UNISUR, emerging out of hundreds of years of indigenous, black and popular struggle and resistance in Guerrero, which demanded recognition of the rights and culture of indigenous and Afro-Mexican peoples, UNISUR was established with the aim of providing higher education with a humanistic ethical focus in the Frarian tradition. Its aim is to train professionals who can contribute to solving community problems and promoting the regions, one of the poorest and the most unequal in the country. UNISUR is totally independent of governmental authorities. Pedagogically speaking, students are constantly questioned about the reality which they experience. And the teaching staff don't receive any form of salary, but they are making their contribution and making their teaching in solidarity with the project. And the UNISO model is connected to its surroundings, its culture and its needs. So zooming back in now to the world of ELT, what I present here is by no means a cohesive list, but rather a 10 point plan of what our sector could look like if Frary's ideas were allowed to have greater influence. The 10 points are in no particular order, but rather provide a general summary and overview uh, and a natural extension of what I've said so far in my talk. So the first point then is a, a genuinely critical pedagogy. A learner-centered pedagogy would be dominant with learners genuinely more active and engaged in their own learning. No more just student talking time, but student discussion time, student analytical time, and student reflection time. Teachers would need to be more willing to take a back seat and let students take the learning in an unfamiliar or unexpected direction. This would need to be accepted and supported at the institutional and systemic level. In pedagogical terms, the role of the teacher would change from being the instructor or knower to something more like an organizer or a coach. They, this would also lead to methodology such as flipped learning being more commonly used and encouraged, where students are given more responsibility to prepare for and to lead their learning. To reflect the reality which most teachers find themselves in, I think we should also be wary of advocating post-methodology too strongly. 
from a Frarian perspective, it's crucial that the classroom is a place where idealism meets realism. And whilst we may agree with Alistair Pennycook that method is a prescriptive concept that articulates a positivist, progressivist, and patriarchal understanding of teaching, for real and so for real social and pedagogic change to happen and for a reformed education system to have face validity teachers need some kind of structure and methodology to follow second point socially active learning learning would be linked to social activism the classroom should be a space in which students acquire knowledge and want to do something with it in order to improve the lives of the majority. Critical thinking would not simply be something which is scattered throughout glossy books, but is something deeper, more profound and existential. The outside world of the, of the community would be brought into the classroom and vice versa. The classroom and the community would not be seen as different spaces, but as overlapping entities. And parents, guardians, and other community members would have much more active roles within educational institutions in a deeply embedded, sorry, in a deeply embedded rather than token lip service way. The third point, participatory language policy. Uh, this more decentered pedagogy, which is more inclusive, should also be reflected in the choices related to the language or more likely languages of instruction. Local, minority, non-dominant languages would have a significant role to play in this, in how knowledge is disseminated and developed. Multilingual practices such as code switching and translanguaging would be normalized and indeed encouraged. The language resources within the classroom would be seen as an asset to be mined rather than as a problem to be solved. And importantly, assessment should also reflect the multilingual realities of the majority of people learning English in order to ensure epistemic and linguistic justice. The fourth point, pro-learner content. Course books should focus on meaningful social issues from a wide range of different perspectives not just a representation of dominant groups, whether at the global, national or local level. Curriculums and syllabuses would move away from their traditional lexical and grammatical focus and be more competency based. Learning would be more problem centered with students learning inductively and through processes such as guided self-discovery. Where there are course books, Course, but content would be a co-construction between experts and users. But there may even be the opportunity to push further and to mainstream concepts and methodology such as dogma ELT, as proposed by Scott Thornbury and Luke Meddings. <clears throat> the underlying principle of this approach is that material should be generated by the learners and the lessons should be directed by them. Learning is dialogic with knowledge co-constructed by all stakeholders. Dogma ELT is presented explicitly in the Frarian tradition. And in his original article, Thornbury talks about a pre-method state of grace in the ELT world, when all there was was a room with a few chairs, a blackboard, a teacher, and some students, and where learning was jointly constructed out of the talk that evolved in the simplest, and most prototypical of situations. Thornbury rightly emphasizes the positive nature of dogma ELT, presenting it as value added rather than in deficit terms. And when he says that this approach is not so much anti-materials, but rather pro-learner. Point five, differently measured progress, a fundamental reevaluation of how we understand progress is desirable. Alongside the changes described earlier, we should also record and privilege so-called softer indicators of progress, such as confidence, attitude, social skills, and self-esteem. Learners should be more involved in assessment, 
as active participants rather than passive recipients. Whilst a fully Frarian conceptualization of evaluation would certainly be a step too far in the education systems which we have now, within the ELT sector there are a number of reforms which could be made that are Frarian in nature. So, for example, more emphasis on formative rather than summative assessment, multilingualism normalized within the assessment process. Assessment should be continuous, not one-off, uh, or and not high stakes. Assessment should evaluate competencies, what students can do with the language, not what they can performatively demonstrate they know about it. And speaking should form a core component of the assessment process. Point six, gap bridging technology. Technology plays a significant role in helping to achieve all of these points. Freire's pedagogical approach wouldn't necessarily, at first glance, suggest that he was overtly a technophile. However, as with his argument about the importance of understanding the language or dialect of the oppressor, technology can be used as a way that learners can critically reflect on their position in society. Freire himself says, it is not the media themselves which I criticise, but the way they are used. And another well-known Frarian sympathiser, Henry Giroux, notes that powerful role that electronically mediated culture plays in shaping identities and the importance of the changing nature of the production of knowledge in the age of computer-based technologies. Affordable technology and open source platforms can liberate knowledge, enabling the poor and dispossessed to consume the same information as those with higher levels of social, cultural and economic capital. Seven, empowering the physical learning space. A positive learning space can have significant impact on students' learning experiences as well as their learning outcomes. There can be even greater impact when students themselves take ownership of this process and are allowed or even tasked with undertaking the wall design uh, of the classroom. When students do this, for example, by putting up their own writing or drawing or other resources, rather than government approved learning resources, they have more ownership over their learning. Eight. Impactful participatory professional development. The model for teacher CPD should follow the same principles outlined for students. That is, the relationship structures should be more horizontal, with all participants afforded the opportunity to contribute. Institutional managers and other educational stakeholders should also be involved in the process as co producers and co-consumers. Participants should be able to feel that they have the opportunity to speak freely. And furthermore, the emphasis of professional development should be on the impact of the training and the impact it has on students and the learning process. It's not sufficient to just do professional development, which is often the case. It's about the positive changes which it results in. Point nine, penultimate point, reimagine rationale for learning English. So at a more removed or macro level, the acquisition of English should be framed not as a positional good or as some kind of ticket into the global elite or as a necessary tool, uh, but rather, sorry, as a necessary tool to participate in oppressive economic and political structures. It's an additional linguistic resource for participating in a global conversation about positive social change. It's a way that the powerless can meet the powerful on equal terms. And there should also be a move away from the dominance of prestige forms of English, primarily British and American English, with other Englishes also contained in learning resources. And similarly, uh, native speakerism whereby L1 speakers of English and L1 teachers of English specifically are held in higher esteem in the job market than L2 or L3 speakers 
particularly, as I say, in the world of employment, should be challenged and strongly argued against. And the final point, then, a revised nomenclature. To underpin and sustain these changes, the way in which we talk about these issues needs to change. The kind of language which we use is often heavily loaded with words like inspector, instruction, scheme of work, all have particular connotations. They suggest hierarchical relations, a prescriptive curriculum, and an atomized concept of learning. Perhaps the most glaring example is that of critical thinking, uh, as we've already discussed today. In modern parlance, critical thinking is presented as a suite of tangible, discrete skills to be acquired in order to succeed in one's personal and professional life, rather than as an existential reflection on our social, political and economic position. The word has been sanitized, neoliberalized and made less scary. But as I have said throughout, education should not be scared of being radical. And if we are serious about making substantive and long lasting change, uh, rather than just piecemeal improvements, we need to change the way we talk about things. So, for example, learning rather than teaching, support rather than feedback, change rather than progress. As I've noted elsewhere, I believe it's unrealistic and probably undesirable to adapt uh, to adopt a doctrinaire Frarian approach to ELT. Freire was very much a product of his time and some of what he proposed for education in Brazil in the second half of the 20th century uh, is less relevant or less achievable now. But there are certainly aspects which can be adopted and adapted into the ELT sector and education more widely. In trying to turn some of these ideas into reality, there are clearly many challenges, not least that Freire is still seen today as a dangerous radical, a Marxist, someone who questions the existing socioeconomic and political structures and wants the education system to play a role in making them fairer. Language and language teaching is critical within this. As professionals working within the education and language teaching system, your own responses to this Frarian agenda will be shaped by whether you see this radicalism as dangerous or as a proportionate response to the prevailing status quo. So final points, Paulo Freire is a dangerous thinker and he has been described, as I say, as a Marxist, a lunatic, an extremist, an indoctrinator. It suits the narrative of many countries and many political leaders to describe him in these terms because he presents a clear and present danger to their continued power and influence. Were we to adopt a more Freirean approach to ELT, our students would become more critical agents who actively question those decisions which are being made by their elected and sometimes unelected representatives. The English language classroom has always liked and wanted to present itself as a safe, progressive space. We like to compare ourselves favorably with colleagues working in other disciplines that we have a more forward-looking pedagogy. And I think to some extent this is true. And it's certainly uh, it was certainly this which first attracted me to the field a quarter of a century ago. But there is much more that we can do in our own classrooms to achieve this. And I believe that adopting some of the ideas of Paolo Freire, if not in full, then certainly in part, would be a way of achieving genuine, meaningful, long-lasting, positive change, not just in our classrooms, but in society more widely. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.